we'll get, get going. So welcome to session nine, Power System Planning and Operations. This session will take us on a little tour around the world. We have Asia, Africa, North America, and Europe represented on the uh, panel this afternoon. So looking for a nice uh, whirlwind, worldwide tour of what's going on. And the session this afternoon will be chaired by Aidan Tui of EPRI. Aidan is the chair of our system operations and market design working group and a long time member of and contributor to ESIG. So without any further ado, I will go ahead and turn it over to Aidan. Okay, thanks Charlie. I guess a lot of good lunch discussions going on still, but uh, yeah, I appreciate the opportunity here to uh, to chair this uh, this this session. That's that's somewhat of a, a variety of different topics. So it's a uh, I think it's the one with the most speakers over the next over these few days. So been asking the, the presenters to keep it pretty terse and keep it pretty tight at a fifteen minute each. But um, and what we'll do is we'll actually have Q and A at the end of each presenter because they are quite different topics. We figured it would just be better to, to do a few Q and A. And if we have time at the end, we can kind of come back and do a, a larger discussion as well. Um, but yeah, without uh, further ado, uh, we'll be we will be taking a little bit of a trip around the world here. So we've got a, a couple of folks from China. We, we got um, quite a few from. Uh, North America, though some of them originally from Europe, and uh, and then from South Africa. So we uh, we've we've got a, a variety of different geographies here. Um, the first speaker is going to be uh, Kaisha Wang. Uh, Kaisha's been uh, been involved in ESIG for quite a while and, and come to a lot of our meetings. So all is great to hear from you. Uh, Kaisha, a senior engineer at uh, at SGERI in China. Um, so I'm very glad um, to give a short update about the system operation with high shares of renewable in China. So as our session have a very tight schedule, so I will keep my presentation short. So there will be three parts. The first is the current status of variable renewable energy development in China. And then the challenges and practices of system operation with high shares of variable renewable energy, and then some perspectives for the future. Um, capacity, um, by the end of 2022, the total generation capacity in China was uh, 2,564 gigawatts, and renewable energy accounted for around 46% of the total, and wind and solar accounts for nearly 30% of the total and uh, nearly 65% of the renewable uh, energy capacity. For wind and solar separately, uh, the capacity of wind by the end of 2022 is 356 gigawatt accounting for around 14% of the total capacity and solar, the capacity is a little bit higher than wind accounting for around 15% of the total capacity. Generation portfolio, in 2022, uh, renewable generation accounted for nearly 30% of the total generation, and for wind and solar, it's around 14% of the total, and around nearly 50% of renewable generation. And for wind and solar, Wind is a little bit higher, it's around 9% and solar around 5%. Um, well, probably um, when talk about renewable energy uh, integration in China, people uh, probably have a very uh, deep impression on the curtailment issue of China in some provincial progress. And we have been tackling this problem for uh, a while for several years with a combination of technical market and policy measures. Now, um, the curtailment rate of wind and solar in China is below 5%. So, you know, we have been doing that for five years in a row. So now the utilization rate of wind and solar is, is not bad. And in recent years, we have some new features of uh, wind and solar development in China. The first one is large scale. Actually, uh, with the announcement of the due carbon goal in China, China entered a new era of fast and large scale development of wind and solar. 
the annually newly installed wind and solar has been exceeding 100 gigawatts since 2020. And the annual generation from wind and solar surpassed 100 tegawatt, uh, 1,000 tegawatt hours in 2022. I guess that will be the case in the next few years as well. It is expected that the newly installed wind and solar this year in 2023 uh, will be around 200 uh, gigawatt. The other one is high share. Uh, in the previous slides, we see the share of wind and solar in uh, the capacity and generation portfolio. And now if we look at the share of renewable in the newly installed capacity, uh, it's, it has been surpassing 50% since 2017 and the share of wind and solar in the annually increased the total generation has been surpassing 50% uh, in 2022. Uh, if we look at the share of wind and solar in provincial grids, we see that by the end of 2022, the installed capacity of wind and solar in nine provinces exceeded 30 gigawatts, and the share of wind and solar in 15 provinces exceeded 30%, with the highest being 63% uh, in Qinghai. And in 2022, the share of wind and solar in 12 provinces exceeded 15%, with the highest being Qinghai as well, uh, 42%. The third uh, feature we see is market-based. Uh, we have this renewable energy law enacted in 2006. And since then, we have uh, seen a very fast development of wind and solar. And we have this uh, feed-in tariff uh, to incentivize the development of wind and solar, but we phased that out um, in 2021. So now uh, the wind and solar development is much driven by market. And um, if we look at uh, the data in 2022, the volume of wind and solar being traded in market um, is nearly uh, 40%. And in some provinces, um, the government uh, said that for the future, the newly installed wind and solar, uh, you know, they need to participate in the electricity market. And the fourth feature we see is um, very rapid increase of distributed PV generation. And we see the share of distributed PV in the annually newly installed PV capacity uh, surpassing 50% for the past two years. And by the end of 2022, uh, the total capacity of distributed PV is now over 100 gigawatts. And challenges. The first one is um, what the challenges we used to face is the efficient utilization of renewable energy to keep the curtailment rate between like um, uh, reasonable levels. With this um, fast development of wind and solar development in China, we do see the trend of increasing um, curtailment again in some provinces. And the second is the power system uh, stability with those um, wind and solar in the system. And another uh, challenge we're seeing um, increasingly is the a secure supply of energy during some periods when there's low wind and solar output. And we have uh, made a lot of uh, efforts to integrate wind and solar in the system. The first is ultra high voltage transmission and inner province transmission lines were constructed to enhance the transmission uh, capability of renewable energy. And by the end of 2022, a total of 33 ultra high voltage AC and ultra high voltage DC lines has been built in China. And we have more than 100 key inner province transmission projects being built as well. And also following the requirement of national energy administration, we have timely and efficient integration of interconnection of wind and solar into the power grids as well. So the second is flexibility of power system were, was promoted with multiple measures. The first is the uh, construction of the downward regulation ancillary, ancillary service market in China. Actually, we we're, were first started that in uh, the Northeast China power grid in 
2014. Probably my colleague later will talk about that as well. By the end of 2022, a total of 26 provincial partners um, in the state grade administrative area have this downward regulation and serious market. This market works like if you can, if the thermal generation can be dispatched down, you know, they will be compensated with a certain rate. And the second is continuous efforts on the retrofit of thermal generators. And um, a total of 81 gigawatt of thermal generators uh, were retrofit to be more flexible. I guess the minimum output of some uh, thermal generation uh, can be zero uh, now. And third is development of energy storage. And by the end of 2022, the install capacity of new type storage, by new type here, I mean uh, electric storage other than pumped hydro, reached 8.7 gigawatts with an average storage duration being two hours. Uh, we see a, a very big increase from you know, the year uh, 2021. And besides, um, we are building a lot of pumped hydro as well. And by the end of 2022, the installed capacity of pumped hydro in China reached around 46 gigawatts. And a third is technologies to support poor system dispatch with wind and solar. And it's always hard to dispatch the system in China because we have a large share of thermal generators in China. So the dispatch centers has been working very hard on uh, integrating renewables, you know, for all those years. Uh, here, I just want to mention that as we have this high share of wind and solar in the system, there are some periods that um, we have um, a, um, a shortage of power supply. And we see that condition during the winter of 2021 when there is a storm. So demand response uh, was used at that time, you know, to make um, the system balanced. So now, you know, flexible load is integrated in the power grid emergency, emergency dispatch. And the second is innovate grid friendly technology uh, like initial response, primary frequency response, high and low voltage, uh, right through, you know, those, um, um, technology of uh, renewable energy. And the fourth is the amount of renewable energy traded in the electricity markets were increased to incentivize more customers to use renewable energy. And now we have uh, around 20 provincial level smart markets uh, started trial operation. And we also have this uh, inter-provincial smart market started and also uh, since 2021, we have this green power market in China as well uh, to support renewable energy development with a phasing out of subsidies and to encourage customers to buy green power. Okay, uh, finally, some uh, perspective for the future. Um, the first uh, four power system with this high share of uh, wind and solar how to guarantee resource adequacy to ensure reliability is, is increasingly becoming a great concern. In the past, we have this main obstacle of integrating wind and solar. We have to, you know, keep the um, curtailment rate between, uh, like below a certain level. And now we have this challenge of secure uh, power supply as well. Um, even though we have this much wind and solar being built, but the output of wind and solar in some period is below 10% of the total capacity. And the second one is, um, I guess we reached the consensus here that is highly necessary and urgent to unlock the flexibility value of demand side resources in power systems. And we have a lot of, you know, uh, mechanisms to, to encourage uh, the participation of demand side uh, resources uh, in the power system, um, in power systems. And the third one is uh, electricity market design needs to be optimized continuously, even though we are now still in the process of building electricity market, but we do see um, there are new elements, right? The demand side resources, energy storage, and in the market design process in China, we are also considering 
to include those new elements in the electricity market design. And the fourth one is with this um, very fast development of distributed PV in China, we do see the pressure of integrating those distributed PV in the distribution power grid as well. And in China, we are now exploring something like the self-balanced distribution system, um, you know, to integrate uh, distributed PV for that business model and market mechanism innovation is needed. Okay, thank you. That's my presentation. Yeah. Thanks, guys, Shen. And for those who were, uh, were late getting back from lunch, we are going to take the, the questions and answers after each individual speaker. So if you might, you know, I can give you the microphone. Um, is there questions for Kaisha? Yeah, go ahead. I don't think the mic was on there, so just just repeat. The, I'll repeat the question here, but but it was around flexible resources and and how you manage those. That they got compensated on that, so it's more like a kind of uh, incentive mechanism on the retail side, like when the industrial users, uh, electricity consumers, you know, when they don't use electricity during those intention times, they got compensated or, and, you know, they shift their, you know, energy utilization, they got compensated as well. So it's now more a compensation mechanism. Yeah. Uh, yes, currently, yeah. Thank you. Th thanks, Kesha. I actually, have, I've got one other question as well, Lord Rad, um, we just have time. Um, so you mentioned the inter-provincial market. Can you, can you speak a little bit more about that and, and how big that is in terms of is, if that's actually, there's a lot being traded on that market? Or... Oh, yeah. Uh, so actually, you know, uh, like we started this new round of power sector reform since 2015. Uh, at that time, for the inter-provincial uh, market, we only have, you know, we started uh, the inter-provincial market for access renewables uh, since 20, I guess, 2017 at that time. But uh, since 2021, you know, we like, you know, we enlarge the participators not only renewables, but thermal generators as well. So yeah, yeah. But the volume is is low at this moment. Yeah. All right. Thank you again. All right. So our next speaker, um, I think most of us know, Aaron. He's one of the, the thought leaders in the industry, and a lot of these these issues are around modeling and analysis. So, um, Ernie Olson, a senior partner at uh, at E three, is going to talk about some of the modeling and storage. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> I'm gonna. Uh, touch on modeling of storage and flexibility from a resource planning perspective. It's going to be a little bit of a how-to um, session. So just to kind of start off, uh, I think everyone's familiar with this proposition by now, but the need for grid services will grow as we add more and more variable resources onto the system. On the right-hand side, there is California's flexible ramping need in 2019 and in 2030. And I think you can see that the trend is up. Um, there's a number of drivers of flexibility taking a step back beyond just wind and solar. We've always had to deal with inflexible low and then we've needed flexibility and balancing services to, to deal with that source of, of need. Wind and solar, obviously inflexible thermal is another reason. Uh, we've, I just recently saw a case study where there was a utility that had a large coal plant. And when they took that offline in their, in their, in their modeling, they found that their flexibility violations went way down. And then they could add a whole bunch of solar, but and then get back up to where their flexibility violations were when they had this big giant coal plant on their system. So just a note that inflexible thermal is also a source of flexibility need. And the, each of these can be solutions as you relax this constraint and make them more flexible. So if you're a smaller system, that's less flexible. Adding a tie will help uh, add flexibility into your system. And battery storage, of course, is the most flexible resource that's ever existed. 
Um, but if it's if it's behind the meter and you you can't dispatch it to your need, but someone's dispatching it to what their need is, that may actually be a source of, of inflexibility and a source of flexibility need to the system operator. So historically, we've we've sort of crystallized as an industry around a set of products, ancillary services that help us quantify and and set aside flexibility to help us get through from the day ahead on into the operating time. You've all seen these charts before, but you know there's flex, uh, frequency responsive reserves, which typically aren't in a market and typically aren't uh, uh, monitored and constraining on a, on a planning uh, study. But then you've got the ones in green, which are the ones that are where the big money is and the ones where we have markets and the ones where we typically will, will model these in our planning studies. So regulating reserves, contingency, there may be spinning, maybe non-spinning, there's maybe a different category. Uh, and then the last one on the bottom is sort of ramping or flexibility reserves, which is sort of the newest category that we now have to think about with all the newest sources of uncertainty that we have. And the one thing that we can agree upon as an industry is that we should all use different terms for each of these ancillary services. <laughs> um, when it comes to planning, then how do you how do you factor this all into your planning framework? So this is kind of our just gener generic portfolio planning framework. And you'll see if you can see this far that sitting in the middle of it all is a, is a long-term capacity expansion model, perhaps it's Plexos uh, LT, of course, and you'd love to be at your, for your long-term capacity expansion model to do everything, to do you know, all your resource adequacy over multiple thousands of years with all of your draws. You'd love it to be nodal, so you can reflect all the transmission constraints on your system, and you'd love it to be able to do multi-stage uh, with uh, uh, inflexibility modeling with, uh, with uncertainty. But of course, it can only do a small fraction of those things, and even those not necessarily very well. It typically has an hourly time step. And it's probably got a sample of days. It's probably you know zonal at best in terms of transmission. So you have to run all these side studies to, 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 to teach it things, to give it non-modeled values or constraints to constrain the optimization. And so one example that you probably have seen is like ELCC surfaces to inform an, a resource adequacy constraint. And the flexibility is sort of a similar uh, factor here. So along the bottom there, we, you know, what we typically will do is some sort of an exogenous uh, analysis, and then we use that to inform the optimization that the long-term capacity expansion model uh, will do. So the way that that exogenous analysis works, it's typically a multi-stage production simulation model where we model uh, sequential decisions made with uncertainty. That looks a bit like this. So first step is you might want to run a capacity expansion study that gives you some sense of what your starting point might be because the value of flexibility might be very different depending on your portfolio. Secondly, you calculate what your balancing needs are. Thirdly, you run production simulation multi-stage under uncertainty to see, is there a big value that we think our, our, our smaller uh, capacity expansion model is missing? And if there is, then you parameterize that value and you bring that back in to the capacity expansion model. Um, starting with calculating the balancing needs, uh, this is something that, you know, for spinning, non-spinning regulation, we have ways to do this for the uh, load following or the flexibility or the balancing reserves. This is something that's, that's new. Um, and that is something that's, uh, that's dynamic. Um, and so it's, it's important to think through how you, how you might do this. It's dy dynamic and it's asymmetric. So we've developed these machine learning uh, tools to help us understand uh, what the sort of envelope of uncertainty might be at a given time step from a time step that's farther back uh, in time. And I'll explain that uh, a little bit on the next slide. So uh, your, your balancing needs uh, are gonna be a function of what's happening on the system at a given time. Uh, so, and your, your different sources of uncertainty are demand, Perhaps there's solar, perhaps there's wind, and maybe there's maybe there's other other uh, variables that could be brought into here as well. But in effect, these things are all uh, causing uncertainty, and that they're causing variability. And when I make a decision at a certain point in time, uh, how to manage my system around these things, I need to have some sense of what that uncertainty uh, looks like. So our machine learning tool will, in effect, take individual uh, forecasts and forecast errors for load, wind, and solar. And it'd be simple if you could just assume that all the errors are independent and you can add them all up and they would be normally distributed, but we know that they're not. In fact, they're often are asymmetrically distributed because when my solar is, is generating at its maximum, it's not gonna go any higher. And when it's generating at zero, it's not gonna go any lower. So it's often asymmetric. And so we think machine learning is a good tool to just help us you know, derive from the data what those, what those relationships are. And so it takes load, wind, and solar forecasts and load wind and solar forecast errors and assembles them into a composite 
net load forecast error that is dynamic uh, based on system conditions. So you then wanna bring this type of information into your multi-stage production simulation model. So this is just a schematic that kind of illustrates that. There are certain decision points at which you have to make decisions. Multiple days ahead, I might have a long start unit that I need to decide whether I'm gonna start it or not. I have to make that decision under uncertainty. So I've got a, I've got a forecast with a forecast error and it's kind of a large error band multiple days ahead, but I, that's the best, it's best information that I have. And so I make the decision, start the unit, turn the unit off. At the day ahead time period, I have uh, some additional choices uh, and my forecast error has gotten a little bit smaller. Uh, and so my uncertainty is less, but also my, my, my flexibility is less than I had three days ahead because I've already decided some units are now off the table as to whether they're, they're gonna be on or gonna be off. Similarly, you go into like an hour ahead time period and now all your day ahead, you know, five hour start resources are either on or they're off. Uh, so your flexibility de decreases, but also your forecast error decreases at that time step. And then lastly, you go into kind of real time and you see how this all plays out in your real time dispatch. But uh, so if you do the production simulation where you do multi-stage at each stage, you make decisions. Those decisions are based, are, are, are made under uncertainty with a forecast and a forecast error. And you take those decisions into the next step. They've now constrained your flexibility at each step. And this is kind of then how you can understand and, and, and model and simulate what your flexibility needs are <clears throat> and the variety of ways that you have to meet them. So then how do we actually use these techniques to get the values that we need to help us understand uh, what our different solutions are? So again, some of, the, some of the value of each resource type is already being modeled in your long-term capacity expansion model. So the trick is you wanna understand which, which values are being left out, which values am I not already capturing in my long-term, in my capacity expansion? And then you use this to zero in on what those values are. And so to do this, you kind of have to do this daisy chain of multiple different cases. The first case is just, I don't have the candidate resource at all. And what's my production cost from that? The second case is now on just on an hourly level, same level that my production, my capacity expansion model has, I introduce that solution and I can understand what value it gives me before I even get into sub hourly flexibility. And the third thing I have to do is run a case that has that, that, that is sub hourly, but doesn't have the resource. And then the fourth case is the one that's sub hourly, but does have the resource. And it's the, it's four minus three. So the, the sub hourly value of the resource, but then minus two minus one. So then subtracting out the value that you're already capturing in your long-term capacity expansion modeling. Then that zero is in on the, the value that's missing from that long-term capacity expansion model stage. And it's important to understand. So what, what's already being captured and what's not so that you can isolate that value that, that, that you weren't already capturing. So you can use these techniques to do case studies around specific flexibility types of, of problems. So one problem might be, you know, I've got inflexible thermal units with large lump of unit commitment problems. And, but then I also have, uh, I have renewables, which I, I can curtail if I want to. If, if I need to, so you can sort of trade those two things off against each other. If I have a big thermal you know, commitment problem, maybe I can use renewable curtailment to help make that problem easier and help reduce the amount of fuel that I burn as I add more and more renewables onto the system. And the lumpier your thermal system is, the more curtailment of renewables is going to help you address some of those flexibility challenges and help you save fuel. Ironically, curtailing renewables can help you deliver more renewables if you do it uh, smartly. The second thing, of course, is the value of batteries. Batteries we know are highly flexible, uh, the most flexible resource that's ever been invented, uh, but because it's so flexible that it can do many, many different things. And so you need to understand what's the highest value use of that battery as you inter introduce it onto your system and these models, because it's, it's, it's enforcing multiple different constraints around different types of flexibility challenges. And ideally it has all the right operating parameters so it knows what what cost the battery has in terms of wear and, wear and tear and providing different services and it can uh, assign the, the battery most uh, in a most valuable way across all those different services. And that also is gonna change as a function of your portfolio. On the left-hand side there, you see what batteries might be doing in a case where you don't have very many of them. And probably then they mostly provide an operating reserve service because they're really good. They can do that very cheaply. But as you get more and more batteries, and this is California uh, on the right-hand side, you'll see it just doing more and more energy arbitrage and less of the reserves as a function of kind of the total battery capacity. So 
each of these solutions uh, to your sub hourly flexibility problems has value, but they also each have cost. So you do multiple of these runs to figure out sort of which additional value the different resources are providing, parameterize those, so that you can put those back into your capacity expansion model as in effect cost modifiers or additional non-modeled values. And the concept here is that as I add more and more flexibility onto the system, this is the right-hand chart there, my total production cost goes down, but these solutions each have a cost as well. And so you wanna to continue to add flexibility until the marginal value that you get is equal to the marginal cost and then stop because you don't want to overpay for flexibility. Yeah, so then uh, we take the, 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 the parameters that we've developed through the sub-hourly uh, uh, flexibility and simulations under uncertainty, use those to modify the value that, that each uh, your capacity expansion model is, is modeling explicitly for each of those solutions. Uh, part of the challenge is that's a lot of model runs to get each of these things and they're different by portfolio. Uh, and so there's probably really only realistically a, a subset of your different resources that you can model in this way. Uh, but the, for the ones that are important, we think uh, th there are some values that the capacity expansion models uh, miss. So just I'll note, uh, again, I've already sort of said this, but a couple more slides just on what higher battery penetration does uh, to the operations and the value of flexibility. So on the left-hand side there, this is California in 2030. With, with, with low battery uh, penetration, you can see we have a lot of curtailment on the top left. The reserve prices are all kind of spiky and they're all non-zero. Um, and then on the bottom, the batteries mostly are providing reserves. When we add a lot of batteries onto the system, it really changes things. In particular, you know, this, uh, the, you know, the middle one on the, on the right is the reserve prices. We see those reserves are almost non-binding uh, in this system that, that we modeled for California when you add a bunch of, uh, of of batteries and just to zero in on that a little bit. So this is the flexible ramping product, the shadow prices in the KISO market uh, at different levels of battery penetration. The light blue line at the top is, is batteries, 1.4 gigawatts of batteries, which is about two and a half percent of peak load. And the bottom dark blue is 14 gigawatts of batteries, which is about 25% of our peak load. And you can see what happens to the ancillary service prices as you add more and more of those batteries. And just for frame of reference, the, the, the dark blue line is where California is aiming to be uh, by 2030. We're gonna add all these batteries just for resource adequacy. And so in that sense, the flexibility is, is free. These are the, the cost of the battery is entirely being paid for by some other service. And so we don't really need to invest more in flexibility in California under this world because we have really almost as much as we, as we could want. If you're, for those of you that are in organized markets, uh, congratulations. You don't have to worry about all this operational stuff. Um, you know, you can just let the market uh, integrate all your resources for you, if, but you do have to pay the cost. So you're not entirely off the hook. You're, just the nature of the problem is different for you. Uh, now, instead of modeling, doing all this modeling to develop shadow prices for all these reserve products on your own system, your job is to forecast the ancillary service prices in your market, which is also going to change as a function of the portfolio, but not just your own portfolio, the portfolio of the entire market. So you need some sense of what's going to happen to ancillary service prices in your market as the portfolio uh, changes over time. And just a little uh, back to the theme of, of what happens when you add more and more batteries. This is just a, an, an older E3 projection of ancillary service prices in California over time. And we can see that you know, all, the, 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 all the ancillary services were, had reasonable values uh, in the kind of 2015 to 2020 time period. And a lot of batteries were, uh, developers were salivating at the idea of getting in there and getting some revenues. But very soon we're gonna have enough batteries that, that all those ancillary service prices are gonna go through the floor and there's not really gonna be a source of value in California anymore. So with that, thank you very much. I look forward to questions. Thanks, questions for Arnie? Maybe, maybe I'll start with one. Um, as a modeler, so, so, so Arnie, there's, li if, there's lots you could do if you had more capability. You, you could run more simulations, you could get more granularity, you could do probabilistic modeling. If you were able to run a lot of these things faster, where, where are the areas you think you'd, you'd leverage that capability if you were to do things, if you were able to do things faster? I mean, that's a, that's a really hard question. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, exactly. Um, 
you know, I, I, this daisy chaining of models where I have to take, I have to, do, I have to examine this specific problem with, a, with one model and then take, take, the, take parameters from that and use it to modify the solution in my capacity expansion model. It's kind of awkward, it's time consuming, it's expensive. So yeah, the more that you can do in the capacity expansion model itself, the less you have to do with all these kind of side studies. Um, that which problem is the most important to throw the computational power at, I think is probably gonna be a, a function of the system and what the specific constraints are. Definitely, you know, be able to model, model more weather would be fantastic. You know, uh, a better resolution on the transmission system would be fantastic, but you kind of have to, you know, pick at least where we are today. Yeah, hi Arne, uh, Abbas here from Albert Electric System Operator. Uh, always great uh, listening to you. Uh, in one of the slides you mentioned that um, uh, lower penetration of batteries, so the batteries are more inclined in the, in the ancillary service market, and once the once the magnitude or the proportion uh, of batteries increase, then they go towards the energy uh, market. Uh, is there a threshold or a thumb rule as to what magnitude of battery as a percentage of, or as a, or as a function of peak load, when it reaches, then the batteries would be inclined towards um, uh, the energy market as opposed to uh, from the ancillary service market? I mean, what, we're, what we generally see, and this may not be true in all markets, like if you have a bunch of hydro capacity, for example, you know, you probably you kind of already have a, a low cost source of a lot of these ancillary services. But in markets where they're being provided by thermal resources, we see batteries as kind of sweeping up the entire reserve market because they can really provide it without having to burn any fuel. Um, and so the size of the, of the, the, the size that where the, where the, where the usage starts to turn is right when you get up to what your need is, right? If I need 2000 megawatts of, of all forms of ancillary services, as soon as I get 3000 megawatts of batteries, you know, I'm gonna mostly have my ancillary services taken care of. And now I'm gonna start dipping into them and using them more for, for energy arbitrage. And I, I wanted to just bring this slide back up because if you can see the, the green area on the right-hand side there, that's, that's the ancillary services. It's, that's still larger than the green area on the left. So even while it's, you know, doing these deep diurnal charges and discharge cycles, it's still providing ancillary services all along the way. And by the way, your batteries can provide ancillary services up to 200% of their nameplate capacity. Because if I'm charging at full capacity, I can go from full charging to full discharging in an instant. Thanks, Andy. Okay. We have time to have one more question. Yeah, this might not actually be the right form for the question, but what are the um, operational, what is in the way operationally for like Kaiso, for example, to actually have this capacity of, like if all of these batteries were on the system now and available, would they be able to operationalize and use them and tell them to charge and discharge at appropriate moments? Or if not, what's the barrier? I mean, I think we had actually some good information on that in was it the first panel of the day, just sort of talking about some of the challenges around the, the, the market software and the way that it blows up the problem when I have to start optimizing now with multiple time steps and lots of different, you know, lots of, lots of degrees of freedom. But, you know, even though that's not perfect now in California, we absolutely are seeing batteries providing a lot of the, a lot of the ancillary services. There's been a noticeable uh, impact on ancillary service prices already. We've got what are the 5,000 megawatts of batteries now? So we're kind of on the way there. We're not, we're not done. So even with the imperfect systems that we have now, this is the type of, of behavior we're already seeing from batteries. All right, well, thank you. Okay. Thanks, All right, ne next up is uh, one of my, my colleagues and I, even though she's my colleague, I still butcher her name. So Genevieve, uh, Jenna. I'm just going to call you, um, is, a, is a tech leader at EPRI. Um, she's uh, going to talk about some of the work we um, we finished here about a, about a year ago now, I guess, um, looking at some uh, value of pumped hydro storage. Thanks. Uh, so yeah, as Aiden was saying, this is a study we completed about a year ago. 
Um, it was DOE funded, um, led by EPRI with support from the, the Brattle group and the PSO analytics team uh, around really evaluating uh, pump storage value in a number of different uh, scenarios and systems. Uh, so I, I've got one slide on sort of objectives and project setup, and then I'll delve right into results. So briefly to go over the project objectives here, I've got uh, four listed. The first two are really around um, identifying and demonstrating and improving upon current state-of-the-art modeling for pump storage operation. Um, I think Nikita's talk really highlighted some of the challenges we see in terms of modeling storage in general. Uh, so did some work on that here. And then the second two objectives uh, were really around that value piece of things. So evaluating the value of pump storage under different configurations and then under different systems and resource mixes. Um, so you'll see the two bar charts here. We've got uh, an ISO system that we evaluated, so an ISO market region, and then we evaluated a vertically integrated region as well, uh, the Duke Carolinas region. And so for, for both of these, we had a, a base VRE, which was roughly current day system. And then we added on to that some level of renewables to get a moderate renewable and a high renewable scenario. Um, we use a PSO analytics software tool for this. So it's a mixed integer program, uh, allows us to co-optimize for energy and ancillary services, allows for the modeling of nested time intervals, um, really allowed us to dig into the treatment of uncertainty and variability in ancillary services. Um, I've got also here a quick uh, chart or a quick table for pump storage characteristics. So there's a, a single pump storage plant in the NISO system that we've already evaluated, and you'll see the characteristics of it here. And then in the Duke, uh, in the Duke study, it was two pump storage plants. So I've got the combined capacity and reservoir size listed here. Um, the one thing I want to highlight before I move on to the results is there were extra constraints we modeled within the NISO region, um, including modeling of capacity market obligations. So you have to be at a certain state of charge to be able to bid into the capacity market um, every weekday mornings, uh, also assign turbine and pump on off periods, um, just a function of how that's, that's modeled um, and, and bidded to the market and hurdle rate costs as well. Um, so wanna keep that in mind. And, and the next piece of my presentation will really focus on the, the last two of the project objectives here, the, the value proposition. Um, and I, I wanna say I, I'll focus most of my results on the NISO system, just because that's the one I was modeling and I'm, I'm a little more familiar with, but I do bring it back and compare it to the, the Duke system during this presentation as well. Um, but here, total system cost savings for the Gilboa pump storage plant. So the way we evaluated that is sort of running one case with and one without the pump storage and looking at the Delta in terms of um, system costs or production costs between the two. Um, and you'll notice the base, moderate, and high renewable mixes. Um, one figure here, the first one is in millions of dollars, and then the second one is in percentage of cost savings, and, and that'll show up a few times in my presentation. Um, but what we notice right off the bat is a fairly modest system cost savings in the base case, um, but then those increase uh, fairly significant in the moderate, and then especially in the high VRE mix case. Um, and uh, another thing I want to draw your attention to is uh, the day ahead versus real time. So uh, the benefits in the day ahead cycle are a little bit larger than in the real time cycle. Um, and that's just a function of, of how we modeled this. We optimized it in the day ahead cycle and that kept that schedule fixed in the real time cycle. So the next slide really goes into the why of this. Um, and the first chart here you see on the left shows the LMP by hour of day. And what it allows us to look at is the average spot price differential, the average daily spot price differential. And we see that it's um, much more modest in the base VRE case at four some odd dollars per megawatt hour, and then increases fairly substantially um, as you move into higher renewable penetration sensitivities. And what that allows is it means the Gilboa pump storage, the new NISO um, Gilboa unit um, cycles more um, and that's, that's really what's driving that increased system benefit. Uh, another thing we looked at was the Gilboa profit. So you'll see here we have the energy market revenue and then the revenue for each of the ancillary services, regulation, 10 minute spin, 10 minute non-spin, pumping cost. Uh, what really jumps out there is a vast majority of that revenue is being made in the energy market. 
Um, not surprising, I think, for most people, the ancillary market is a, a fairly shallow market when you compare it to the energy market. Um, we also calculated pump storage value. Uh, that's calculated as the total system operating cost savings. So you saw that a couple slides ago divided by the annual Gilboa generation. Um, and so we notice in the base scenario, it's about $12 per megawatt hour, dips down very slightly in the moderate scenario and then increases to almost $20 per megawatt hour in the high VRE scenario. Um, again, just the factor of, uh, even though that, that numerator is uh, increasing monotonically, uh, so, is the, so is the denominator there. Now, comparing this to the, the Duke system, I think is where we see some really interesting results. Um, so the, the most left, left hand graph there shows the real time system cost savings and what jumps out is the Duke ones are a lot larger than the NISO ones. So I want to spend a couple slides here just talking through and dissecting why that's the case. Um, so the first thing to consider is the fact that we don't have the same amount of pump storage installed in both regions. So we do have um, about double the capacity in the Duke region, about three times the reservoir size. Um, so the middle chart you see there is a uh, calculated savings at a dollar per megawatt of pump storage generating capacity basis, um, just to sort of be able to compare those a little bit more easily. And then uh, the right hand graph you see uh, is real time profits and you can see again the Duke pump storage plant profits are significantly larger, um, but what we noticed it was a handful of very high priced hours um, where there were violations that had a really outsized impact on plant profit levels. So we calculated if we had had a $100 per megawatt hour price cap, what those profits would have looked like. And they did get reduced fairly substantially there, um, especially if you look at that base and moderate BRE mix, they're a lot more comparable to the NISO system. Now, another thing we looked at is the pump storage value, which I talked about um, a few slides ago. Again, there's that total system cost savings component, which I just looked at, and then there's the annual generation component. So I show total generation here on the, your leftmost slide slot for NISO and Duke, and, and it, you notice is the Duke plants are generating a lot more. So there's a few different regions for that. Um, first, the daily price separation is much larger in the Duke system than in the NISO system. Um, the bottom charts here show the average spot price daily. Um, and you notice the spot price differential on average for the Duke system in the high renewable scenario is about double that of the NISO system. Uh, so something to keep in mind there. And then there's a couple other factors that drive this. First of all, the Duke plants have a higher efficiency um, and they also were modeled without a hurdle rate where the Gilboa plant was modeled with a $1 per megawatt hour hurdle rate. So what this means is there needs to be um, a little more price separation there for the NISO plant to, to make it worth it for them to operate and to, to have that energy arbitrage. Uh, so the next few slides, I wanna focus on a couple of sensitivities we ran. There are a lot more that I, I won't have time to cover here. Um, these will be NISO focused. So the first that I thought was interesting to highlight was the nuclear build out sensitivities. Uh, we ran that just for the moderate and the high variable renewable mix. Um, what you notice, so we retired all the nuclear capacity in the system in this sensitivity. And you'll notice that the benefits from the pump storage plan are decreased in both cases, uh, proportionally much more of a decrease in the moderate than in the high variable renewable scenario. And so I um, wanna talk through that in this next slide, uh, the reasoning for that. And it, it, it becomes really apparent when we look at these LMP um, spot prices, average spot price curves. Um, so what you notice is when you remove nuclear in the moderate renewable case, you actually have your spot price differential that decreases. And you see in the high renewable case, that's not the case. If anything, it increases ever so slightly, but stays um, fairly true. Uh, and we dug into that a little bit and noticed that it was uh, due to a difference in terms of what, what was replacing that nuclear generation. So in the moderate renewable case, what we saw was that it was combined cycle units that were coming online and replacing nuclear. Um, so again, gas units on the margin sort of reduces that daily price separation um, compared to nuclear units. And then in the high renewable case, what we noticed was it was actually about half of that was replaced by previously curtailed renewable generation that was coming online. So that really explains the difference in terms of spot price separation and then consequently in terms of pump storage plant dispatch that we were seeing in one case versus the other. 
Uh, the next set of sensitivities that I want to highlight, um, we're calling these technology sensitivities. I apologize, I realize on this slide it's not clear, but these are run for the high renewable scenario only. Uh, so the first one is around modified C rate sensitivity. So what happens if you increase the pump storage capacity, but you keep the tank storage size the same? Um, perhaps unsurprisingly, what this leads to is an increase in the benefit for the system. So we saw about 23% increase in the day ahead cycle, 20% in the real time cycle. So it really shows us that there's a, a value proposition there for, for extra capacity on the system. Um, and then the second one is the variable speed pump storage sensitivity that we ran. So in the base case, the plant is a fixed speed pump storage. And what that means is that in the pumping mode, it's either on or off. It can't really operate at all points of its operating range. Now, variable speed, now that we allowed it to do that, um, one of the key things that changes is it can now fit into ancillary services and provide ancillary services where it previously couldn't. So we evaluated a couple different pieces there with just for PMIN, 48% of PMAX or 25% of PMAX, just an indication of the operating range. Uh, what we noticed is the dispatch in the energy market didn't change significantly, but the reserve provision increased fairly substantially, as you can see from the bar chart there. And so overall, that increased the benefit of the Gilboa pump storage plant by 6 to 9% in the day ahead cycle, depending on which of those we look at, or 3 to 5% in the real time cycle. Uh, the last set of sensitivities I want to share with you, again, these were run for that high renewable future. The first, and these are sort of what we call pump storage operation sensitivities. The first is around allowing for real-time redispatching. So if you remember the base case, we optimized in the day ahead cycle and then kept that schedule fixed in the real time. What happens if we allow the storage to deviate from that day ahead cycle when the opportunity cost is large enough? Well, Again, unsurprisingly, we did see that that extra flexibility increases the real-time benefits um, to the system. So in this case, about 4% in the real-time cycle. Um, and then the last sensitivity I want to highlight here, I've got it in red because I think it's a really important one. Um, we're calling it no pumping or generating schedule restrictions. So if you remember at the very start, I talked about the extra constraints we had on the New York pump storage plant versus the Duke pump storage plant. And one of those was limitations in terms of when it could pump versus um, generate. And so if we remove that now, the Gilboa charging times change dramatically. So instead of pumping in the middle of the night, it now pumps during the middle of the day because it's taking advantage of that duck curve that occurs in high renewable scenarios. And so the system benefit actually increased very substantially, almost by a factor of two in the day ahead cycle and very substantially in the real time cycle. So what that tells us is it's really important for us to revisit these operating assumptions that we sort of have baked into our systems as we transition to different, different systems. And now just going over a few key insights. So first, accurately modeling pump storage behavior, um, it does present several challenges. There's increased computational complexity. There's a lot that goes into determining the appropriate storage parameters. Didn't go over it here. You got a little bit of a flavor of it from Nikita's presentation. It's in our report as well, if you wanna look through that. Uh, second, perhaps obvious one, if you've been listening, but the benefits of pump storage were a lot larger in the Duke system than in the NICE system. And what we saw is it wasn't due to one single thing, but a lot of different pieces sort of brought together in, in terms of capacity buildup differences and different constraints that you applied in system modeling assumptions. Um, third key insight, economic impacts of pump storage increase with variable renewable penetration. And we saw this across the board, even in these two very different systems, cost savings increased by a factor of four in Duke and actually nine in NICE in the high renewable case compared to the base case. It would have been a factor of 18 if we hadn't imposed that pumping or generating schedule. So very substantially. Um, fourth key insight is uh, resource mix, technology assumptions, operations, those all impact value perhaps not surprising again, but interesting to see how those different sensitivities can impact value um, differently in one system or another. Um, and so really shows us the value in terms of analyzing all these things in our specific systems as our system change. Um, and with that, uh, that's all I have. So I'll take any questions. Thanks, Shannon. Any any questions for, for Jenna? 
Well, I see John's coming up, but I have a, a quick, maybe it's half common, half question because I was involved in the project, but um, the, the last sensitivity you showed with the, the significant increase in value, I mean, in some ways, that's the real value of pump storage in, in New York there. It's just the other stuff is, is constrained because of the, the current market rules around pump storage, right? Yeah, absolutely. And, and had we had a chance, I think it would have been really interesting to rerun all of these with that constraint removed to see um, how, how that would have affected all the different results. Um, I assume in all of the scenario testing that you maintain the same import schedules on the tie lines that New York has with its neighboring systems? Yes, so for this, we not only did we maintain that, but we also maintained that there's, uh, we didn't retire any extra generation and we didn't um, change any of the transmission um, or build out any transmission. And, and the choice for that was really to try to compare, change one thing at the time so we could really um, isolate that impact. But it's an excellent point. We, we went back and forth for a little bit about which of those approaches we wanted to take. All right, thanks, Jenna. If there's no other questions, then um, thanks again, John. Right. So we kind of started with something relatively broad, and the last two presentations really focused on storage and some of the modeling issues. Um, Scott's going to talk about some of the kind of real-world issues here, and as SRP are um, are actually getting ready to to integrate a large amount of inverter-based resources over the coming years. So Scott's been leading a, a really interesting initiative there around operational readiness. Um, with Salt River Project, so just got All right, thank you, Aiden. Appreciate that. Um, a little bit about SRP, especially for our international colleagues. Um, it's a small, um, a vertically integrated utility, uh, about five mile, five hours down the freeway, close by here in Arizona. Um, this summer, we reached uh, just a little over 8,000 megawatts in our in our BA, and that was about two and a half percent higher than our forecast too. So. Um, but today I'm going to talk a little bit about our operational readiness strategy, um, and then I'm going to touch upon a few learnings as well. So just, uh, just a few years, you know, basically two, and eight, two years ago, we made a major announcement that we're going to go to 2025 megawatts of solar by 2025. And so we recognized that was going to be a, a, a big shift for us. We only had about 200 megawatts of solar at the time, very small number. Um, and so we really wanted to get our hands around, you know, the dynamics and the variability associated with that. So we created what's called our operational readiness program. Um, and that's, you know, the capability for SRP to operate um, that future grid safely, reliably, and cost effectively. Um, you know, so 2025 megawatts on an 8,000 megawatt day, you can do the math, fairly significant. But we do have uh, shoulder periods, you know, twice a year where we're down to about 2,800 megawatts. So, you know, doing the math, you're upwards of 70% penetration on those days. So quite significant. Um, you know, we, we did consider um, kind of, you know, make it very near term. 2025 is right around the corner. Uh, we did consider a few things out of scope. Um, we participate in a very limited market currently, the KISO energy imbalance market. And so we took future considerations like a potential ISO RTO in the future, out of, out of the dynamics in terms of the decision-making for operational readiness for the time being, um, and other technology like you know um, eight-hour batteries or hydrogen turbines or those types of things. Um, that really helped us simplify the strategy, kind of keep it on the near term. You know, we hear so many things in this conference about grid farming inverters or inertia. You know, what's the most important things to operate those, you know, the, this, this amount of inverter-based resources? And I think our strategies focused on those near-term challenges but also recognizes the other ones too. And I'll get into those details here. Um, just a little bit about the project approach. Uh, I do wanna mention this. Um, we spent a lot of time up front on internal and external data gathering. We looked at um, efforts within industry from, from EPRI, from, from NERC, from NREL, from others, really summarize those efforts. Um, uh, current efforts internally, like our integrated system planning um, effort and those things. And we did a lot of surveys. Um, I mentioned TGO here. Um, we had a survey specific to operators and traders and what their thoughts were on inverter-based resources. Then also looked at the broader SRP stakeholders. And the task four here was really looking at industry best practice, reached out to many utilities here in the room, talked about what they've learned so far, what some of their challenges are moving forward. And that all factored into the gap analysis. 
One thing I do want to mention here is a series of think tanks that we ran. And these think tanks were, you know, really the, one of the first times we had people like resource planners and analysts in the same room as operators and traders. And the dynamics of the questions that were developed in that type of setting were, were quite significant. Um, you know, probably very elementary topics to this particular team. And some of, you, some of you in the room here supported those efforts. In fact, EPRI was on our core team to develop the strategy. Um, so once we had that gap analysis that really focused on the themes and the readiness strategies and implementation tasks, which I'll move to next. So we came up with um, technical readiness themes, and that's where I'm going to spend most of my time today, and enabling themes. And the enabling themes are really about, you know, corporate programs and efforts to break down silos, work together more collaboratively, um, continuous improvement, those types of things. Um, and also foundational elements related to making learning a little easier in the company. Okay, you know, wh what is uh, a tool like, um, let's say, uh, Aurora? How is that used in the department? Um, for, an, for an operator and trader to understand a little bit more and how that relates to the operational perspective and vice versa, for like a resource planner to hear some of those concerns about, you know, how, how reserves are managed on the front end, front end is extremely foundational with that enabling themes. Um, so that would be the topic of another presentation to talk about the gray bars here. And so I'm going to spend a little more time talking about each of these five themes here. And so this is kind of those, those five themes that you see. Uh, we have 20 plus projects across these five themes. And what we did is we aligned these up with the home department. Uh, we signed people to these teams. We've been at the implementation now for about a year and a half. Um, the percentages you see here are the progress we have to date in each area. And we have some significant progress to share. And I'm just gonna touch upon each of these a little bit. The first one is the fully leveraged new resources and capabilities. And that starts with that visibility and physical dispatch. You know, we looked at our existing PPA. We recognized that it was pretty much must take. You didn't see the word dispatch in there a lot. Um, so we really uh, worked to enhance um, you know, the curtailability and the flexible dispatch and AGC control of these future resources. And we also did a lot of um, testing of, of you know, the resources ourselves with the assistance from some consulting. And now we're into our fifth um, EMT study on the new resources coming. So there's a lot wrapped up in that number one. Um, another one I'll mention here is just the value stream analysis. You know, I mentioned being a vertically integrated utility in a, in a limited market because it really does start with capacity and energy, making sure that works then moving on to other value streams. Um, you hear a lot about inertia and grid farming inverters in this, and that's really in that item 12 that we see there, that inverter technical standards. They're stepping through every board and every part of IEEE 2800, determining how we're gonna adopt that internally. Um, but also looking at it, at, at, at move forward, the, the e-sig paper on, on grid farming is extremely valuable. And we're working on leveraging that with our suppliers to consider grid farming as we're moving forward. Um, you know, economic dispatch is all about, you know, doing that with IBRs. We're, we're good at traditional generation and we've been at it for decades. Okay, but how do we consider batteries? How do we consider solar plus storage in that type of setting? Um, you know, PCI is a cost, optimizing, cost optimization tool. We use them really the real time operations and supply and trading to set that dispatch schedule. And we use Aurora and serve them and other tools at the, the research um, planning area. But what are the assumptions that each of those tools use? Um, what are the outputs? Um, you know, we have a workshop coming up here in about a month that just internally getting those same players together I talked about to explain each tool, bring Plexos and PSO into the mix, understand the use cases. Because what we're finding is um, bringing a, you know, a fairly large audience, and I'm not talking about 100 here, but you know, the 20, 20 people or so, and really it leads to some great dynamics and questions and, finding the right solutioning for that. Um, and then, okay, risk adjusted reserves. Uh, you'll note one project that's marked complete here. I think there's a lot more we can do with flex reserves and we're working on those types of things also. But the initial stage of the project was concluded. So we call that 100%. Um, some folks in the room here were involved in that initial effort with the consultant to put that together. We used the PSO tool for that um, and really, uh, it's the first step in recognizing the variability with the solar. 
And uh, I'll talk a little bit more about that here in a second. And then advanced forecasting, uh, we recognized with the small, we had a few 30, 40, 50 megawatt plants. We looked at the, the accuracy of the forecasting. Um, it was off by as much as 50%. We realized when you bring that out to 2000 megawatts plus, you need to do a better job of that. And, um, uh, and on 16, let's just say that says load forecasting improvements. We need to focus on our own load forecasting improvements. I gave you the example of what occurred this summer. Um, but, you know, and then also work with, with KISO too on how we can um, work on both our load forecasting and make that a little bit better. Um, the last theme here is uh, about software and situation awareness. And there's an element to that in all the first four themes without question. But it's such an important topic. We have it here listed on its own too. Um, you know, prior to energy, in, in energy imbalance market, it was pretty much about the energy management system and an outage management system and a few other things. So when we entered that market, that's when we put the cost optimizer in place and added a few other software and, 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 and processes. Um, but that made the software system extremely complicated, uh, created a lot of redundancies, naming issues, and, and manual patching uh, and efforts that occurred at, at the real-time desk, both with the traders and the operators. Um, and so this, this one's largely about um, doing a better job with the additional systems that we add and make, making sure we do that lockstep. Um, so that's a little bit overview, just touching upon each of the projects. Um, before I switch gears and talk a little bit more about each project or a few of the projects um, in their cells, I do wanna mention it's more than 2025 megawatts by 2025. Uh, you know, so we use this graphic, we affectionately call this our Monument Valley graphic. And it shows about where we are today. Um, and it starts with that customer solar layer. You can see that growing slightly over the next few years towards 500 megawatts. Then you see the significant amount of solar, which largely reflects that 2025 megawatts by 2025, a little bit more. And then you see, start to see the battery elements where we have solar plus battery in the darker blue and then battery only in the lighter blue. But this really, so we're right up around 3,500 megawatts of IBRs, pretty significant for an 8,000 megawatt BA. Um, and so this does a good job expressing the, the immediacy, um, the urgency of the challenge that we're faced with. You can see the, the SRP hiker there is right on the precipice. We're working on bringing three very large hybrid resources online that represent about 500 megawatts point of interconnection but two of those have a significant overbuild. One's actually 180 percent, um, which I'll touch upon here in a second. So project one, um, bolster testing. Um, bolster is one of the few inverter-based resources that we own and operate ourselves. It's 25 megawatt Tesla battery. And so we, you know, when we originally commissioned that, we didn't do a full suite of tests, okay? Uh, we, but we did is we worked with a consultant um, and we identified uh, you know, a testing plan and then we, we performed that testing plan. And it was really focused on the interconnection issues you see here and the, fun and the utilization also. Almost think about that as um, items in the large generator interconnection agreement versus items that were in the, 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 the PPA. Um, we certainly weren't able to um, test the items in the blue there. And so that was our first EMT simulation that we had done in not ever, we, ironically, we, we did quite a bit of EMP simulation about 15 years ago, but worked to do that to kind of look at the voltage and the frequency ride through. Um, since then, we've done this for three additional sites and we are making recommendations to move um, EMT analysis you know, into our transmission planning efforts. So project two, we call dispatch flexibility to IVR PPAs. And, I'm not going to repeat the items in the first row. You've heard that from the other speakers too about that fl flexible dispatch. But it's more than that. It's about telemetry and control data requirements, just general com communications, how quickly that occurs, doing better jobs of forecasting, you know, even get our, getting our better hands around um, you know, the types of telemetry we have in the stations, the radiance mon monitoring weather stations, um, and then just operating procedures and dispatch constraints. So learned a lot from other utilities, um, especially the publicly available um, Hawaii electric PPAs that are out there. And, and uh, you know, continue to build this one up um, 
So it represents the needs we have. And so also in project two, we said we're gonna go back and look at existing contracts and make those more flexible as well. So we'll go back to our monument valley graphic here. And you can see that, okay, there's that distribution of solar layer that's not gonna be dispatchable. But we're, we continue that next layer, I'll call that the lighter brown. We continue to whittle away at that. I think there's um, about 350 megawatts in there. Uh, and we're working on even sizing that down to about 100, 150. And so, uh, you know, our, our operators especially wanted these to be flexible. And I think this really represents um, what, what they want to do. So we've made significant progress in this area. Good value streams, um, you know, being a vertically integrated VA, it starts with energy and capacity. So that's where we're starting. And I think this slide shows that. And next, we want to value um, that regulating reserves and how we're going to do that and contingency reserves. Another one we're working towards, um, orange in here is the voltage support. So, um, a lot of education and decision making around whether we want with the hybrid or co located resource. I don't think I need to spend too much time on this for this audience, but we were totally new to this, you know, and so a lot of conversations over the last nine months on what was our, these, these, three resources that we have coming online right now, how are we gonna do that? We did hybrid and we really did it for two reasons. Um, based on some energy management system issues, okay, we weren't able, weren't comfortable sending two signals for the co-located and we wanted to control the variability at these solar plus storage sites to the plant, okay? And I have some graphics here that'll show that. I'm almost out of time, but let me, no. All right, I managed that. So I'll just um, briefly mention this and then go to my closing slide. Uh, so this on the left here really shows this one resource that has a 260 megawatt point of interconnection um, it, with a with a 460 meg, eight megawatts of solar behind that. So that's a significant solar overbuild. The battery is equal size to the 260, but it shows a good job how we are, are planning that state of charge when the battery is gonna charge when we may have some clipped energy there. Um, but this really did a good job of showing that even in those summer days when we have 118 degrees, that oversizing is gonna allow us to dispatch that battery at a common level into up towards 10 or 11 o'clock potentially. Okay, so theoretical though, we haven't proved this out, but it does create a great baseline to work from. And I'll just go ahead here. There's a few other things that you can look at. I encourage you to look at the reserves and the forecasting efforts, and I'll just close it on really the software infrastructure improvements. Um, in order to look for, you know, I talked about that software ecosystem. We had to kind of take very specific block diagrams and kind of write out what the different systems do, what PCI does, what the energy management system do, does, what the plant controller on site is going to do. And this is really valuable for those teams to make better decisions around that, that software ecosystem where it stood today and where it needs to evolve towards in the future. Um, and so we continue to make improvements on that. And, but these, this type of diagram was really important in doing that. And then just kind of to close it out, the operational risk challenge is really about the variability and uncertainty. Um, I like the graphics here because it's one of our uh, 100 megawatt solar sites. You can see on a sunny day how cleanly it operates. Get a little bit of clouds um, and you do just more variability. And then on a very stormy day, you can see how it operates too. So this has been effective, showing the challenge that we have in front of us and uh, how we're gonna go about that. All right. Thanks, Scott. All right, thank you. Um, I thought it was always sunny and clean. So, so. Do, do you ever get those on other days? I, mean, I feel like Phoenix is mostly that top day, right? What's that? You, you mostly get that top day in Phoenix, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, if there's questions for Scott, please, please come up to the microphone. Yeah. I, I, have, a, I have one as well while um, people are coming up. But um, as you mentioned, we, we were part of a, a little bit of this. And one of the things I saw was, was really important here was kind of getting that buy-in from the full company. Can, can you speak a little bit more to like how, how you did that and made sure folks actually felt kind of ownership in some of this and really re help, help able to progress some of the work you're doing? Can you repeat the question? Or? How, how much were people able to really get that buy-in, the, the other parts of the company, how were they able to kind of feel that buy-in so that they could be they could participate in the projects as, you, as they yeah. went on? I mean, I, I think we, we set up a lot of 
it's a constant effort, um, but you know, to levelize the playing field so everyone has the opportunity to get involved is probably the greatest challenge, I would say. Um, you know, scoring high in an operator's mind is extremely difficult. I think sometimes we hit the mark, other times we don't, but uh, we continue to work on getting every, you know, everyone looped in, so yeah. How did you decide what percentage of customer owned uh, solar you would take? And also how did you compensate customers for that? So the question was related to customer owned solar. Um, yeah, you know, you saw it as a pretty small level, right? You know, and that basically is where we're forecasting that. Um, the area that we're focused on here is really focused on the bulk power system variable resources. So we don't really get, uh, the pro our program doesn't get looped into that. I'd probably have to line you up with someone to get the right answer on that. Hey Scott, uh, good presentation. I'm curious, as a vertically integrated BA, uh, you have a lot of challenges kind of internally. Do you think it's easier in your setting or in a, an ISO setting to, to create this kind of momentum? Um, yeah, good question, Sean. Um, so, you know, I, I spent effort, uh, extra time there kind of setting up that we're vertically integrated and the decision making largely reflects that. And you hear in a lot of swarms like this, especially about regulation that, you know, you bring a hundred megawatt battery and before you're using exclusively for regulation, Well, we don't have the same drivers. So it starts with those, that capacity and energy and really working from there. Um, and, you know, it's great to talk about grid farming inverters, the value of EMT, all that's, you know, but we're really, we're still in those initial stages. You know, we want to get that resource um, operationally reliable so we can get the basic functions out of it first. So I, I don't know, I, I'm, I'm glad we don't have an additional market to consider right now. I'm glad we don't have more DER right now. So it makes us a little more focused for the time being. And I think all oh, that's gonna come in due time too. Okay, so now we're uh, gonna move across to uh, South Africa. Talk about some of the, the issues around auxiliary modes in the, the South African region. So, uh, Barn and Kosi uh, Sebeko, from who's the chief engineer of national operations at ESCOM, is going to talk about some of the, the interesting work that they've got going on there around uh, oscillations. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Bongosi Sibeko. I'm from SESCOM, uh, South Africa, in the Operation Development System Operator. Today, I want to talk about the uh, operations challenges driven by oscillatory modes in the South Af South Southern African uh, region. I'll start by giving you a background of the Southern African uh, power pool. Um, I'll follow up with the, some of the events and themes that happened in the past years. And then lastly, I'll give uh, a brief about lessons uh, learned in controlling and managing oscillatory modes in South African power pool. Um, if uh, we superimpose uh, South African uh, network to Europe, we can see that uh, the network starts around Spain to around um, uh, Netherlands, Germany there. And, uh, in the Southern African pool, we connected to other regions. Uh, we have three control areas. ESCOM is the main one and then the, the largest, about 80% of capacity from ESCOM. If you can check um, on the, or the, uh, in the orange or yellow part, uh, we can see that most of our generators are in the Northeast. So about 80% is uh, coal generators. Then we have um, a lot of uh, wind novels in the coastal areas. And then at the bottom there, there's a power station, a nuclear power station, of which one of the largest uh, units is, is there. <laughs> connected to other countries, we are connected via wind link, via 400 kV line, uh, connecting a north, of, north part of South Africa to, uh, to the north part of uh, Mozambique, to another control area in South Africa. So we can see that um, approximately the length from the south part of South Africa to, um, to the another control area, the third one is about 3,000 kilometers. 
So we have a large isolated sparse transmission network with the long high voltage lines. Uh, looking at the left-hand side, uh, this uh, South Africa alone, uh, the peak load for this year was about uh, 34 gigawatts. By dividing or showing the, the peak per province, you can see that the northern parts of uh, South Africa, uh, there's about uh, 10 gig in Houting, the central part of it, and then also northeast, uh, the peak is about 5,000. So where renewables are, predominantly uh, they load it's uh, relatively low, about 1,000 megawatts in the Northern Cape and then also in the Southwestern side uh, of, of, uh, of South Africa. Our transmission lines range between 132 kV to 765 kV lines. And then in the middle of the screen, uh, we have different types of uh, power stations. South Africa only, we have installed capacity of uh, 46,847 megawatts. The IPPs, the independent power producers, um, no, most uh, they use uh, the, uh, the renewables. So it's about 6,200 uh, megawatts. Currently, the energy availability factor for ESCOM generation is about 55%. So a number of machines are out of due to uh, breakdowns. So normally we hear, uh, we hear, a, lot of, you hear a lot of uh, words about load shedding. So to meet the demand, we need to uh, get, uh, shed some load. Top right, um, total renewable 6002, and then we've been trending the load. So since 2014, we've been uh, gradually increasing uh, wind. Then also in the middle, we've been gradually increasing the PD. But of most, um, of most uh, notable, uh, there is a, there's a, a lot of increase in uh, rooftop PVs. Because of the performance of our fleet, uh, the customers are starting to put their own rooftop PVs and some are even going uh, off the grid. So for last year, March, it was around 1,000 megawatts. And then this year, it's around 5,000. So it's about uh, 4,000 megawatts increase. Contribution from renewables this year was about 22%. So they're doing very well. Okay, between uh, us, South Africa, the bottom there, and then we have what we call the Grid Master Power Controller, GMPC. The role of the GMPC is to control voltage uh, between two control areas to facilitate a safe up, uh, parallel operation of the AC and the DC system. Also under split mode, the, uh, it controls the frequency. So normally when the, the two areas uh, get split via the AC, uh, the, the controller takes over and controls uh, frequency on that element. Also, it, what it does is uh, it, it, it balances the power between the AC side and the, side, the DC side of the transmission. One of the limiting factors of the, the grid power control is uh, whenever frequency deviates uh, by 0.4 hertz, uh, plus minus, uh, the, the GMPC uh, saves the harmonic filters by opening the bus coupler. Then that happens uh, after a delay of about 18 seconds. And then if it deviates by 0 0.8, um, and then also it opens the 0.8 hertz, it opens the bus coupler uh, with a delay of about 200 milliseconds. So why we're here, um, I'm just gonna give you a debrief. Um, the hierarchy of different power system stability classification, normally it's three types, it's the voltage type, voltage stability, frequency stability, and auto angle stability. The first one, the voltage, we don't necessarily have, we don't have a lot of, we don't have problems in South Africa. We can manage that. Normally if it happens, it's uh, locally within the network. Frequency stability, because of we have a lot of trips and we have a lot of load, load rotations, normally frequency goes up and down a lot, but it's manageable. The challenge is the rotor, st rotor angle stability. Uh, that's the focus of uh, my, uh, my presentation today. So if we ask ourselves, how will they move to low carbon economy impact operations? Like we showed that um, the dominant uh, uh, power stations or the type of power station is in the Northeast and then um, renewables are in the, in the um, coastal areas. So how will the growth in, influence, uh, growth in the influence of inverter-based renewables? So I'm going to give you examples of uh, the incidences that we have and recorded. 
The first one is a local and inter-area modes of oscillation in South Africa. So the oscillation there is 0 0.1, 0 0.4 to one head. Then it grouped two, we grouped it and according to the groups, it's a sub inter-area modes of oscillation. So normally it's a 0.3 heads of oscillation. Uh, there's about five different examples of uh, how the mode was excited. The third one was the um, undamped oscillation caused by some unit that had a stack governor of. Generally, um, this mode of oscillation um, is within South Africa, but it's, uh, it's inter-area. So the group of uh, generators in the Northeast tend to oscillate if triggered with the group of generators in the South, Southwest. Um, they're normally well damped, the, especially the, the, the recent uh, strengthening where we parallel uh, 765 KV from the North to the South. It um, helped a lot in the strengthening this mode. But uh, the types of locations of exciters and power transfer nucleators, uh, weak inter interconnections, uh, insufficient control systems are the ones that affect this mode a lot. Um, back in 2010, there was an incident that nearly um, caused the system blackout. Um, what happened, it was early in the morning around four, four, four o'clock, then some, a unit was coming back uh, to synchronize from, uh, uh, from an outage. Uh, what happened there is uh, one feeder, if you can see that the Pegasus feeder was on bypass, so they were working on the breaker. So we used the bus coupler on the left-hand side, bus coupler B on for KV bus coupler B as a line feeder. There was a fault on one of the lines on the left, left hand side. And then the breaker on the line didn't trip. And then the fault um, open face, uh, the bus section uh, tripped together with unit six. So you can look at uh, the diagram that I draw on the, on the right hand side. The station was decoupled. So we had uh, five units uh, electrically connected far away from the rest of the system. During that time, about five generators tripped. Um, then uh, uh, it took about, about three hours, but what we did to, to normalize the system, uh, we tried to couple the, the bus section to close, but it couldn't close. And then what we did, we took the units that were on AGC, automatic control, uh, gener automatic generation control of AGC so that they don't um, cause oscillations. We stopped that unit that came back from outage to load up and then we, we, we stopped it from loading up. Um, we allowed the unit six that was on the other side to synchronize. Then by doing that, the angle became closer, um, uh, smaller, then we could, we managed to close uh, or couple the substation. Um, from the findings, uh, we didn't have uh, power system stabilities installed in and around East, East uh, Power Station, that we had poor, visi visibility, uh, poor visibility because we didn't have uh, PMUs installed. After the event, we obviously simulated that we used the RMS simulation and power effects because of this was one of the biggest uh, uh, incidents. So we installed PMUs across the country, uh, about total of about 28, and then eight are uh, online. Then the, uh, another type of uh, oscillate uh, mode that we have is a 0.3 uh, mode. So the group of ESCOM generators in the south tend to oscillate with a group of uh, uh, generators in the north, because we have a weak link there. So uh, stability issues that are very complex are affected by types of location of exciters, power transfer as well, weak interconnections and insufficient stabilizing, stabilizing uh, stabilizers control. One of the examples that happened, uh, we had a, a fault on one of the DC lines, it was uh, I think pole one. Um, pole one is the pole that we use as a carrier for communication between the, 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 the the one of the power uh, substation in the, in the north of uh, South Africa, then to give it a reference angle to, uh, uh, to, to Songo in the north. So because of that pole one, they didn't have that carrier and then uh, uh, the, the power system stabilizer didn't operate and or, or malfun malfunctioned. 
So we started having oscillations and then uh, the uh, oscillations uh, were, not, were negatively damped. Then at around 1001 peak mode, uh, the tie line, the line that uh, connects the two control areas uh, tripped or the, the power swing relay uh, operated. So oscillations lasted about 50 seconds. We normalized the tie line. Then at the second event after an hour, the same thing happened. Uh, we closed the breaker, then oscillations again. Um, the other types is uh, the oscillations that are triggered by load rotation during load shedding. Because of we are short of generation, um, we normally implement what we call load shedding. So 2000 megawatts around the country, some the customers will have about or close to two hours without power. So we connect, we disconnect them after two hours, then we connect them, but we do it across the country. So about stage six is about 12 hours without uh, power, but not continuous. So we switch it off, we switch off for, uh, for four hours, and then switch, off, switch it on, and then the, the pattern repeats. So here, while we were uh, rotating, uh, load, the frequency uh, climbed up to about 50.4. Then that triggered the, the bus coupler at Songo from the, from the GMPSC, that we started having oscillations. So on the graph in the middle is a frequency um, plot, and then on the right is a um, power plot. So we measured uh, from our side, but we saw the oscillation from our neighboring countries. Second graph, the similar thing, um, high frequency, the bus coupler tripped and the uh, oscillation started. Then uh, we, we, we reached up uh, 50.5, which is high frequency on our side. Other type is whenever we have the control systems that are inoperable, like uh, SVC with POD, if it's not available in one of the countries, or some PSS that are not um, tuned correctly, any small disturbance can lead to uh, power oscillations. So this is the week of, 12, uh, of, the, of September 12 to around 12, 13, 14, 15. So every day we had such incidences. Um, that week we had, we didn't have uh, both uh, critical uh, con uh, power oscillation dampers in the network. This one shows a uh, multiple unit trip it was a light load around 30 December. So we lost about six units of each step. It's like, it was like 15% of the total generating unit. There was a fault on the transmission line. The frequency um, dropped. Luckily there were uh, some customers that uh, uh, dropped load. Then the frequency went up a bit and then it went down. And then um, IDR, instantaneous demand response um, operated. And also some customers, some large customers um, uh, disconnected, but UFLS didn't operate. But what we see afterwards, uh, the GMPC, the bus coupler did operate, then it caused oscillations and then we separated with our neighbors. This is typically what uh, oscillation can cause um, if, we, if uh, we don't have the coordinated um, uh, control systems or auto control systems and manual interventions. So here we had an incident, we had an oscillation coming from the north. Then they, uh, we started oscillating. Then the, the Thailand tripped. Then there were events that happened. So there was load that was lost. There were some units that uh, tripped. So we're going up and down, frequency going up and down. Uh, then also there was some manual intervention. The controller will um, call one of the portions tend to synchronize and then it, it was late and the next thing is frequency is high. So there were a lot of uncoordinated and uh, uncoordinated uh, events. But we, after this incident, we, we, we coordinated and make sure that we, we balance between the auto, auto, auto responses. Okay, this one was the last one. Um, there was a unit that had a stuck governor uh, is oscillated for about 10 minutes. So system operator had to cut it. Uh, so currently what we're doing is we monitor the damping on the system using a PMU uh, or WEMS, wide area monitoring system. Uh, whenever we see damping less than 2%, we, we are most likely to, uh, to treat the power line or to oscillate. So we're using it uh, a lot. 
In conclusion, uh, lessons learned for effective management of ulcerary uh, modes in the SEP, importance of joint fault investigation and sharing of data, modeling and simulation of events post, post -disturb disturbances, tuning of excitation control of model validation using uh, real data, installation of uh, power system uh, stabilizers. We coordinate uh, primary and secondary pl uh, plants um, within the SEP utilities. We make sure that we operate within the limits. Uh, we give inputs to grid expansion. Uh, the last one, uh, we are in talks. Uh, we, we, are develop we are in, in the process of development of the real uh, time monitoring tools uh, together with NREL and CSSR for operator situational, situational awareness. Yeah, thank you. All right, any, any questions or comments? Uh, I, I might start with one there. I think it was on one of your bullets at the end, but I guess, first of all, have you looked at how some of these issues may become better or worse with, with increasing shares of inverter-based resources? And then have you looked at using, say, you know, if it's batteries actually with, with power oscillation damping to, to support some of the issues here? Is that is that part of the plan to address some of the oscillation issues, just understanding the role of inverter-based resources? Yes, that's part of the issue. That's why we're trending the damping. We're make sure, making sure whenever we decommission something, then we do the studies and then we install or re reinforce the network. Um, uh, Said uh, from uh, Neom. Um, just have a quick question. Uh, uh, the, uh, the oscillations uh, uh, in the control room and uh, in the, uh, if you have a monitoring system, do you have anything monitoring like alarm and alert uh, showing the gain and the damping uh, of the oscillations? Yes, we do, uh, but using the PMU system, uh, WIMS. So live from the locust plot, it shows the damping that also the- Okay, so the, you have the, the locust plot, plot so, and then it, it, it generates the alarm for the control yes. engineers? Yes, so there's an alarm, we can set the alarm, especially for the units, the, the units that we think that is critical, but we do have. Okay, thank you. So I also from a national grade uh, GB system operator. I just follow up this question. Yes. So when you identify uh, through the PMUs, might be some uh, damping is not uh, negative. Yes. Uh, what action are you taking? Is that based on some offline studies or is that based on the real time you actually can determine which generator might be causing the oscillation? Yes, real, real time we, because damping is low. So our, some of the controllers are in, um, in our neighboring countries. So what we do is to call them to, show, to ask them if uh, those controls are out. And then again, we run the system within limits because of um, if we impact or import a lot, then uh, there's a, uh, if there's a small disturbance, then we, we tend to oscillate. So we make sure that we don't import or export a lot. So we run within limits, especially transfer limits. So we have transfer limits uh, for, for, for small signal. Transient. So is that mainly just based on the past experience, you know which generator might be the cause of the issue? Yes. All right. Then also we do also start offline studies as well, just to, to have the limits to say, okay, the controllers mustn't uh, exceed uh, this, uh, this, uh, the flow, and then even frequency as well, because of it affects a lot. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thanks very much again. Thank you. Right, so, um, we are at our, our last speaker of this session. Um, I do appreciate all the other speakers uh, getting through this in, in a timely manner. So um, back to China again, back to where we started the panel. Um, we're going to have uh, Shibo talk about some of the experiences in the, uh, in the Northeast China grid. And, uh, Shibo's been with ESIG meetings in the past, so it's always good to hear from um, what's happening there in the Northeast. Okay, thank you again. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, the presentation title is Large Scale Renewable Energy Integration in the North Sea China Grid. Oh, sorry.
It's okay. Okay, let me start again. Um, my presentation title is Large Scale Renewable Energy Integration in the Northeast China Grid. And the uh, four parts in my presentation, first is the great outline, second is challenges we are facing, and third is measures we have taken, and the last one is next work. And the North China grid is one of the six regional grids and the state grid corporation of China. The grid covers three provinces and the eastern part of Inner, Inner Mongolia. The area served is 1.28 million square kilometers and the population served is 112 million. By the end of the August this year, the grid's total installed capacity is 199 gigawatt with the peak load of 74 gigawatt. And uh, the thermal power is 106 gigawatt 54% of total, and wind is 52 gigawatt. Percentage is 26%, 26 percentage, and solar is 22 gigawatt, 11 percent, and hydro is 12 gigawatt, 6 percent. Nuclear is 6.68 gigawatt, 3 percent. And uh, the diagram shows the electricity from January. January to August 2023. And uh, you can see the thermal electricity is 257 terawatt hours, accounting for 63%. And uh, for wind, electricity is 81.8 terawatt hours, 20%. And solar generation electricity is 21. 0.8 terawatt hours, 5%. And the grace load is featured as double peak in winter and summer. In summer, the peak loads occur around 11 a.m. and 5 p.m. And in winter, it appears around 5 p.m. The summer peak load is 72 gigawatt. The winter peak load, 74 gigawatt. And uh, the right diagram shows the typical summer and the winter daily load profile. This diagram shows the grid power load profiles in recent, in recent three years, 21, 22, and 23. And uh, new energy development. In 2022, the grid's new energy, new energy, uh, here, new energy refers to wind plus solar. Development got accelerated with the installed capacity being 65 gigawatt, an increase of 11.6 gigawatt compared with 2021. In 2023, the new energy developments would get further accelerated with the expected total capacity to be 85 gigawatt, an increase of almost 20 gigawatt. By then, this figure will be accounting for 41% of the total installed capacity and the generation expected to be 158 terawatt hours, accounting for 25% of the total generation. And this diagram shows the great new energy installed capacity and the percentage. And you can see for 2023, the, the installed capacity will be 85 gigawatt, accounting for 41%. And this diagram shows the great new energy electricity and the percentage. By the end of the August 2023, the new energy generation was 103 terawatt hours with an increase of 31% compared to 
compared with 2020, 2022, of which the wind generation was 81.8 terawatt hours and the solar generation was 21.8 terawatt, terawatt hours. On April 7th, 2023, the maximum new energy penetration reached a record high of 39.69 gigawatt, accounting for 58.5% of the electric load at that point. This diagram shows the new energy electricity and the utilization rate for the over past years. And this diagram shows the electricity by wind and solar from January to August 2023. And now come to the challenges. Challenge one, increase the risks of system operation, security and stability with high new energy penetration and high inverter-based resources connected and considering the random and intermittent features, the system stability levels in frequency and the voltage tend to be decreasing, thus increasing risks of secure and reliable operation. Challenge two, the slow growth of the load and the limited trans-regional power transfer capacity. The slow load growth and the limited trans-regional power transfer capability pose serious situations for the new energy integration. Challenge three is high coincidence of heating period with high wind generation. North East China region heating period usually starts from November to April, highly coinciding with the high wind generation. Higher CHP units operation mode makes smaller space for new energy integration. The last challenge is the insufficient quick and flexible regulating units. The most newly built power sources are wind, CHPs, and the nuclear. The hydropower and the gas fire units capable of quick peak regulating are in smaller percentage. That's not, that's not meeting the needs of the new energy integration. Now come to the measures. What kind of measures we are taking to deal with the new energy integration? The first is we extend the power balance mechanisms from three-day cycle to seven-day cycle, enabling comprehensive evaluation on power production mode, load and the new energy forecasting credibility, transmission equipment maintenance arrangement, and demand side management. The benefits we get include optimization of the thermal power unit commitments, reducing the numbers of the generating unit, start and stop operation, decreasing, sorry, <coughs> decreasing new energy integration costs, paying for ancillary service uses. And uh, the measures, the next measure is the ancillary service market. In 2014, the first China ancillary service market was established in Northeast China Grid. Based on the ancillary service market, the thermal power units have been guided to make in-depth peak regulating to make room for more wind and solar generation integration. Thanks to the ancillary service market in the period from January to August 2023, the grid's total additionally integrated new energy generation was 30 terawatt hours, accounting for 33.7% 
of the total new energy generation of this period. And this diagram shows the basic concepts of our salary service market. Why is the we set 50% 50, 50 of load rate as the threshold between free and paid power regulation? And driven by the salary service market, so far, 58 gigawatt of the thermal power flexibility retrofitting has been completed, accounting for 65% of the total thermal power capacity. Some thermal generating un units have achieved the minimum stable operation load rate as low as to be 15%. 34 CHP plants have been installed with thermal storage with a total capacity of 6.42 gigawatt, realizing decoupling of electricity generation from heating. By taking all these measures, the increased index regulating capability in our power grid is 17.29 gigawatt has been achieved. The grid's average thermal power load rate has been decreased up to 35% at minimum. And this diagram shows the yearly grid's average minimum thermal power load rate. For 2023, this figure is 35%. And this is the CHP technical solutions we have taken. And this diagram shows the CHP flexible retrofitting with electric boilers. And this is the thermal storage of Senfa CHP plant in Tongliao, in Mongolia. And now come to the new type of energy storage. We continue to promote the novel energy storage development and application carry out study on power dispatch and control mode of novel energy storage. At present, there are 28 novel energy storage stations in the North Sea China grid with a total capacity of 860 megawatt or 2020 megawatt hours. Two types of the new energy storage. One is large scale independent storage. Another is wind solar plus energy storage. And this is the Alien or vanadium flow battery energy storage. The plant capacity is 200 megawatt and 800 megawatt hours. Phase one now in operation, capacity is 100 megawatt of 400 megawatt hours. Now come to the pumped hydro operation. There are four pump the hydro stations in operation with a total capacity of 4.1 gigawatt. In 2022, the pump the electricity of the pump the hydro stations was 5.1 terawatt hours and the power generation was 3.9 terawatt hours. Pumping, pumping times is 4,243 and gen generating times is 4,250. And during high wind generation, the daily operation of two pumping and the two generating has been adopted. And this diagram shows the pump the storage, pump the storage hydro generating and the pumping electricity and efficiency from January to August, 2023. And this shows the, the multiple pumping and gen generating And this is the pumped hydro installed capacity and the utilization hours for the three pumped storage stations in our grid. Now come to the actual operation case. On February 27, 2023, the grid's new energy penetration reached 38 gigawatt with daily electricity generation being 719 gigawatt hours. Wind power gen penetration was 32 gigawatt with daily electricity generation being 
710 gigawatts, all figures were at record highs. What kind of actions we have taken? The actions we have taken include one, as large as four gigawatt of the thermal storage facility was put into operation. Two, pumped hydro operation, three times pumping and three times generating. Three, nuclear units operation load rate was decreased up down to down to 76%. Four, Dalian flow storage operating at maximum capacity, 100 megawatt. And the five, trans regional power transfer trade output as high as 3.03 .03 gigawatt with treated electricity of 52.85 gigawatt hours. Last one, four gigawatt of thermal units shut down orderly arranged two days in advance. This is the great new energy penetration load and pumped hydro operation on February 27th, 2023. Now, last, last one, next work. By the end of 2023, the new energy installed capacity is going to be 85 gigawatt, being 41% of the total capacity. And by the end of 2025, the new energy installed capacity is expected to be 120 to 130 gigawatt. Accounting for 47% to 50% of the total installed capacity. By then, the combined solar and the wind will become in the largest power source in our power grid. And uh, what kind of work we are going to do includes improving accelerated service marketing and promoting thermal power flexibility retrofitting, promoting the novel energy storage development and application, speeding up pumped hydro construction. By 2025, the pumped hydro capacity is to be 7.1 gigawatt. And by 2030, the total capacity will reach 10 gigawatt. That's all, thank you.